Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest owner is Dr. Nigel Vasukuti from the United Kingdom. Dr. Vasukuti is currently a consultant orthopedic surgeon in the United Lincolnshire Hospitals. His subspecialty interests are foot and ankle surgery and diabetic foot reconstruction, in addition to managing general trauma. He has undergone diabetic foot reconstruction training in King's College London, in addition to several fellowships. His research interests are primarily on Shaco foot reconstruction and local antibiotic treatment for diabetic foot. If you've noticed, Dr. Vasukuti has delivered a few lectures on our channel before, and today it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Vasukuti for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gopalan. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to come back to this great platform. Hello everyone, um, good evening here, those who are in this part of the globe. Greetings from um, rural England. I'm, I'm based in Boston, Lincolnshire. And this is where I work, um, United Lincolnshire Hospitals, we work on multiple sites. Now, what are we talking about? Um, so today we are discussing on midfoot trauma. Um, we'll concentrate on um, the first part of the talk will be on Chopard joint injuries, then Lis Frank joint injuries, and then we'll also touch upon open injuries of the foot and uh, crush injuries. I have no conflict of interest in the, for the content of this presentation. Um, I've anonymized all uh, um, patient related images <clears throat> and most of my pictures are from the public domain and I've acknowledged them. Now, a midfoot anatomy um, you know, should be familiar to most orthopedic surgeons. You have the metatarsals, um, the three cuneiforms uh, lining in with first, second, and third, then the navicular, and the tail is forming the medial column, then the lateral column is a fourth and fifth metatarsals articulating with the cuboid and then the anterior process of the calcaneum. You have these ligaments, the dorsal calcaneum cuboid, the bifurcate, the dorsal talonavicular, and then you've got the three bundles of the uh, plantar calcaneum navicular ligament or the spring ligament. Now these two eponymal joints, uh, the uh, Lisfranc joint and the Chopard joint, they were described by these two gentlemen. Um, Liz Frank was a, a French surgeon and gynecologist, and Chopard, incidentally, was um, a French urologist. Um, so your midfoot technically consists of that part, the navicular, the cuboid, and the uh, three cuneiforms, and that's the Liz Frank joint between the metatarsals and the naviculars, and your Chopard joint is technically the talonavicular and the calcaneo cuboid joint. So what are the mechanism of injuries for a Chopard fracture dislocation? Um, this was published over 40 years ago by Main and Jovet. Um, so when you see a midfoot injury, that looks like a mild injury, say an und undisplaced cuboid or an undisplaced navicular fracture. Um, there could be more to it than meets the eye from your plain x-rays. Because if you think of it, um, look at the mechanism of injury. So you see a crush injury of the cuboid. Um, or even uh, just a straightforward linear fracture of the cuboid. Think of the mechanism. So it's important to take a proper history in these cases. If there is an abduction force involved, then... Um, there is a compression on the lateral side, but there is a distraction force on the medial side leading to a ligament injury. So technically, this is a through and through injury across a Chopard joint, making that segment unstable. So again, um, several authors have looked into these mechanisms. Um, uh, so similarly, a, with an adduction or an adduction force, you see the navicular fracture but it's as more to it, there's also a ligament injury and the lateral column involved. Then you have axial loading mechanisms, uh, which can lead to Lisfranc or Chopard joint injuries. Um, classification, um, 
published uh, by Zip and Remel. Um, they have they talk about these lines of injury. So the transnavicular or the transligamentous injury, then the transcuboid. So the transcuboid and the transnavicular are the more common ones. Again, navicular fractures. Um, this is one of the several classifications described depending on the degree of combination and the direction of fracture line. Uh, we don't use these uh, a lot in practice. Um, again, similarly for cuboid, there's an OTA classification. Now, clinical features. Um, for midfoot injuries, <clears throat> it can be uh, very subtle sometimes and uh, not a lot of soft tissue signs or at the other end of the spectrum. You may have significant foot swelling leading to compartment syndrome and um, um, skin compromise. A classic sign described is a plantar midfoot ecchymosis, both for Lisfranc and for Chopard. It suggests a plantar ligament injury, basically. If there's a plantar ligament tear and bleeding into the uh, plantar midfoot structures, you see this plantar ecchymosis. <coughs> now, um, a lot of us may think, I don't see many Chopard injuries. Um, that's true, it's not a very common injury, uh, but it is possible that we may have seen and missed them. So um, these undisplaced naviclas and undisplaced uh, cuboid fractures may be actually significant Chopin joint injuries. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's why they say you may not have seen it, but it may have seen you. Now, investigation, uh, your standard plain X-rays as in any other condition. So be aware of these lines, the Saima line. This is a smooth wavy line that, that connects the telonavicular and the calcaneocuboid joint. And uh, if you have a strong suspicion and uh, your uh, plain X-ray does not give you enough information, have a very low threshold to go in for um, a CT scan. Now, management of uh, these injuries, uh, if you have at the lower end of the spectrum, at the milder end of the spectrum, if I put it that way, you have the stable ligament injuries and the bony avulsions, and you have the undisplaced tarsal fractures, and by your clinical assessment and radiological assessment, you are you have ruled out an unstable component to it. You have ruled out a significant element to it. These can be treated with a walking boot or you know, whatever your practice is um, initially with a below knee plaster. And then you know, when the soft tissue settles, you can um, let them weight bear gently with these uh, walking boots. However, displaced fractures and fracture dislocations need anatomic reduction and rigid fixation. And uh, you have to have this approach to management, which is again, your basic for any uh, limb trauma. First, you assess the circulation and neurology. Then you assess your soft tissue. Then next priority will be to reduce a dislocation and stabilize it. Stabilizing you know, can be a plaster or um, you may have to use metal work, which we'll come to in a bit more detail. Then you go on to a definitive fixation and decide how you want to rehabilitate your patient. So this following this basic algorithm is, is very crucial for these uh, complex foot injuries. Now, if you see a bad dislocation like this, um, you do not have the time to organize theater and take the patient to theater um, for a definitive fracture fixation but you will have to reduce this dislocation in an emergent manner. This may have to be done in the um, accident and emergency or casualty department uh, with uh, you know, sedation or whatever your pro local protocol permits. And uh, once that is done, if it is stable in a plaster, well and good. If not, you may have to do a temporary stabilization with the transfixing pins or spanning external fixators. Um, spanning external fix fixators, you can try several combinations, but um, you can do it without going into the tibia, without breaching another bone. You can do a simple spanning fixator like this one I have drawn. Just put two pins, one into the fifth metatarsal, one into the uh, 
uh, first metatarsal, provided they are not fractured, and then a denim pin, a pin with threads in the middle into the calcaneum and took sp and spanning um, bars on either side, or you can do uh, transfixing KYs like this. These are temporary till the patient um, and the soft tissue is ready for a definitive internal fixation. Now, you may not always be able to reduce these um, in casualty in a close manner because of soft tissue interposition. So this has been identified in literature a very long time ago. Um, you can have the retinacular trap between um, the chopard joint bones, or you can have um, the tibial posterior tendon trap, trap between uh, the bones. So if you look at this x-ray, so that's classical where tibial posterior tendon is trapped, preventing reduction of the telonavicular joint. Now, once you're in theater, um, you should have a plan how you want to go about it. Um, you can use an above knee or a below knee tunique, um, have the patient supine, mark out your incision, have a clear surgical plan. And most of these patients need a CT scan to plan your procedure. So have a tunique and uh, a sandbag to keep the foot straight up like that. Plan how your x-ray will be coming in. Um, so you don't want to be struggling in the middle of your operation with positioning and uh, x-rays. Now, this is a, a case, one of my cases from last year. This is a 70-year-old involved in a road traffic accident. Um, obviously, you can see those, uh, those metatarsal fractures jump out at you. But uh, what um, you can see this fracture talus, combination of the cuboid, cuboid bone here. And if you look at that, the, the show part joint is badly disrupted. The telonavicular and the calcaneal cuboid joint, they're badly malaligned and disrupted. So you need a CT scan. You can see that the talus and the cuboid fractures. So it's a very unstable injury. Um, so you have to stabilize this. Um, so in theater, that's an um, image intensifier picture. And uh, actually, this was done in two stages. Um, the first stage had to be done by the um, out of house on call team, the trauma team. Um, and uh, the, the talus was stabilized initially. And um, then we let the soft tissue settle down. And the stage two, we went on to address a lateral column. So the middle column was done first, then we went on to address a lateral column. The cuboid was quite badly comminuted. So you can see all that bone graft that's been um, used to fill up. So you distract it, get it out to length, fill that voids created with bone graft. And then a bridging plate, a spanning plate has been used to stabilize it because in some situations it'll be difficult to, even with your best kits, your small locking plates may not be enough to fix these um, comminuted fractures. So better than using an external fixator with the risk of pin site infection. Um, here I put in a spanning bridging plate to get the length out um, with uh, you know spanning from the fifth metatarsal to the calcine. That's an X-ray at about uh, three months, and these bridging plates can come out about, about three months time-ish. So another one, um, a navicular fracture. Um, here, there were two big chunks of, so here, casualty have done an ankle x-ray. It's not very obvious, but you can see there's a significant injury in the midfoot. So if CT scan has shown a navicular fracture, here you can, that's the head of the talus and that's a navicular. So here, there were two big chunks of bone um, with no significant combination. So I could get away with um, two cannulated cancellous screws and um, get a stable uh, fixation after a reasonable reduction. Um, now, if you have a Taylor fracture, then you know you approach it standard methods. Um, I've taken this picture from the AO website. So you have this um, antero, your anteromedial incision. Um, you can expose the fracture talus. Um, so be mindful of go between. You can go between the tibial anterior and the tibial posterior tendons, and uh, get it uh, reduced and out to length. Um, make sure if there is combination, you may have to and they, uh, you may have to expose dorsolaterally or anterolaterally as well. 
get the lateral column, uh, look at the lateral column, check the reduction, and you can put in uh, candelated cancellous screws, uh, but make sure you countersink them or use those headless compression screws, uh, which are now quite common in the market. Very important not to apply too much compression as you'll end up shortening uh, that column. So it's important to keep the length out. Um, again, for navicular fractures, um, um, you may, um, they're not very common. I mean, even in reasonably busy um, trauma units, you get two or three a year at the most. So your approach will be, again, a dorsal median. And uh, because the navicular extends across, you may need to have a second dorsal lateral approach. And uh, it's important to get the length out. Um, so once you've exposed, be mindful of the superficial peroneal nerve branches. And uh, this particular instrument um, yeah, is a, a Hinterman retractor. So you put KYs through those and uh, get it out to length. Make sure your joint is, joint is lined up, but you may end up having large voids of bone if it is comminuted, then you can fill these with some bone graft and um, use a small fragment locking plates that are available. Um, if you need to span it, if you think it could collapse, you can span it with a bridging plate or a mini external fixator. Similarly, for cuboid fracture, similar to the case that I showed you, um, here, cuboid fracture, you approach with a sinus tarsi or an extended sinus tarsi approach, um, expose your cuboid, get it out to length. That's the most important part, get it out to length. And uh, if you're lucky enough to get a stable fixation with those small locking plates, fine. Otherwise, you can do what I've done in the previous case that I've just uh, put up. Yeah, something like that, a spanning plate. Similarly, you can have anterior process of calcaneum. These are actually quite common. You see a lot of um, anterior process calcaneum fracture in um, twisting injuries. It is one differential for um, a twisting injury of the ankle, you know, one differential for your so-called ankle sprain. Um, but as if there is significant trauma, this anterior process calcaneum fracture can be part of a Chopard joint injury. You can use a lateral sinus tarsi approach and fix it if there is a significant fragment. Now, if you do midfoot operations, this is one piece of kit that you should have on your shelf. It is so helpful. It's called um, either a pin retractor or a Hinterman retractor. So basically it, it has these holes, which takes um, whatever size of K-wire that goes to. I mean, some of them take a one mil or a 1.6 mil K-wire. And um, you can use you can um, use that to anchor into the proximal and distal bone, and then open out the clamp, and you get distraction. So you can use it for your you know for your elective fusions as well. But for these midfoot um, comminuted fractures, you can use this uh, Hinterman retractor to get it back out to length. So once you've opened it out, you can see it falling back out to length. Then you join. Then you get your articular surface lined up, obviously you will end up with a void in the middle, which you can fill with bone graft. Um, sometimes after your definitive plating, you might end up with the residual instability. You may need to transfix, transfix this with KYs or uh, with a bridging plate. Now, there's all this uh, literature, all this in literature, but primary fusion of these um, uh, intraarticular fractures, whether it be midfoot or whether it be calcaneal fractures, it can be done, but it's not as, as, as easy as it sounds because fusion of these um, in a trauma setting is not like your elective fusion, your planned fusion operations. Because one, your, your soft tissue is bad. There's been a recent trauma. The, the bones are so badly comminuted. So preparing the joint is not going to be a mean task. You know, getting rid of the cartilage, you could end up with pieces of bone coming out of the wound. So that is very difficult. Um, so I would try and get a reasonable anatomic reduction and stabilize it. Even if the patient comes to a fusion later, if you have a reasonable alignment, if you've got the length um, restored, your fusion will be um, easier later. 
mean, that is one um, one point of argument for fixing calcaneal fractures because calcaneal fractures has been there's all this in the literature about um, poor results with fixation, but and a lot of these needing fusion. But if you restore the anatomy, restore the alignment, the length, and the height of the bone, you can easily do a subtile effusion later. I'm talking about calcaneal fractures. So similar principle applies for midfoot injuries. You try and get your length out, do a reasonable reduction and fixation. If you can prevent a malunion, um, not every patient will need a fusion because they can get away with um, insoles and steroid injections if they have a painful midfoot arthritis. Uh, but so it is, I would try and get the length out and uh, reduce it as a uh, reduce and fix it as much as possible. But if you have to, then uh, if you have to do a primary fusion, then you, know, you have to do an adequate preparation, add bone graft, maintain length and do a fusion. Post-operative care, these patients have to be kept completely non-weight bearing. Um, Midfoot, uh, uh, there is no way you can let them weight bear early like your ankle fractures. So, but these have to be kept non-weight bearing. Um, I keep them at least for six to eight weeks or maybe longer. Even after six weeks, I let them, I protect them in a boot and let them weight bear in a boot. Um, do not forget your thromboprophylaxis. In a compliant, compliant patients, you can um, let them do non-weight bearing active uh, range of movement exercises. Now, metal removal, um, your locking plates do not have to come out, but any transfixing metal obviously is best taken out. If there are percutaneous care wise, they have to come out within six weeks. Your bridging plate can maybe stay in a bit longer, but better to take them out before three months. Complications, uh, your foot fractures, you're always worried about soft tissue complications than anything else. Um, if you look at literature, they're not huge compared to what we worry about. Um, it's about zero to 10%. Um, skin, skin edge necrosis or your incision line necrosis um, is a worry. Again, peroneal and sural nerve injury is something you have to be aware of. Um, navicular avian is more common than we think. Um, and they can collapse and give rise to significant arthritis. Uh, malunion is more difficult to manage than arthritis. So there are all these classifications um, on malunion and nonunion. Um, what does literature say about the clinical results? So always better results are with an early anatomic reduction and stable internal fixation. Um, the ones that fare badly are the ones that are not properly reduced. And especially the ones have been missed. The missed ones do not do very well. Then ones with severe soft tissue injuries, they, again, they do not do very well. Um, and again, interestingly, uh, primary fusions do badly. Okay, that's about Chopard joint injuries. Now going on to Lisfranc injuries or tarsometatarsal joint injuries. Um, we have, we've uh, talked about Jacques Lisfranc who first described this. Tarsometatarsal joints, are slightly different in that you have these five rays. So the, the function or the mobility of these are completely different. So the, you have the medial column, the middle column, and the lateral column. The lateral column, the fourth and fifth metatarsal, and the cuboid metatarsal joints, they are more mobile with a sagittal plane movement of between 10 and 20 degrees. Compared to that, the medial column is supposed to be stabilizing your foot. And that's why the, the foot actually um, is quite an interesting piece of engineering with all these bones and all these um, joints, these complex articulations that permit three-dimensional movement, that permit a stable um, anchor when you're standing. And imagine when you're running, the amount of load that you put through these small joints. And so the medial column is designed for stability. So you, you load the medial column. The lateral column is designed to be flexible. So if you're on uneven ground, so the lateral column accommodates. So therefore the fourth and fifth tarso metatarsal joints have got more range of movement while the medial ones do not. So if, again, if you look at this, 
the keystone is the second um, the second tarsal metatarsal joint is a keystone so if you look at it the second metatarsal is wedged in between the medial cuneiform and the lateral cuneiform so that is a very stable configuration again if you look at the lateral cuneiform it is wedged in the other way between the second and the fourth metatarsal so that together forms a very stable configuration. Now, this is an interesting paper on anatomy of this joint. So this paper says that the anatomy of the joint is a risk factor for Lisfranc dislocation and fracture dislocation. So as per this paper, they say this, this wedging of the second TMT that is more that second TMT joint is shallower in those that sustain Lisfranc injuries versus controls. So that bony architecture, there's a Roman arch configuration uh, with this. Again, like I said, the second metatarsal is the keystone of that Roman arch. Then you have all these multiple ligaments uh, that connect. Um, but interest, so from two to five, you have all these, uh, excuse me, two to five, you have all these ligaments connecting the tarsals and the metatarsals. However, there is no strong ligamentous connection between the first and the second metatarsal. And again, the our Lisfranc ligament is a ligament running from the medial cuneiform to the second metatarsal. So it has got a dorsal component and a plantar component. Now, um, so what is a Lisfranc injury? It is where the metatarsals dislocate from their normal articulation with the tarsal bones, and it most commonly involves the first and second metatarsals and the uh, middle and intermediate cuneiforms. Clinical findings, um, you know, it can be from the mild end of the spectrum, um, a patient who walks in with a painful foot, but and is able to walk in, there will be some tenderness along the tarsometatarsal joint to the other end of the spectrum where the patient presents with significant swelling and deformity and plantar ecchymosis. Mechanisms of injury. Um, so this was the first one that was described, a horse rider falling off the horse with his foot got still stuck in the stirrup. So that is one classic mechanism described in uh, ancient orthopedic, old orthopedic literature. Um, we do see some um, following road traffic accidents where the foot, um, you know, where the force into the TMT joint is from the actually the pedals. Then another mechanism where the your patient got his foot stuck in a hole and he's fallen over. So it can be a direct impact, force directly onto the tarsal metatarsal joint. It can also be an indirect impact and an axial loading with or without a twisting component. Classification um, sprains are at the milder end of the spectrum. Um, they can be graded as one, two, and three. Um, several classifications have been described. There's a homolateral and divergent. Um, it's homolateral where all the metatarsals are shifted in one direction. Divergent is where the first metatarsal shifts medially and the lesser two metatarsals shift laterally. Um, Myosin's classification is the one more widely accepted. Um, total incongruity, partial incongruity, and divergent. So you can see total incongruity, partial incongruity, one or more rays, and then divergent. So the first ray is shifts medially and the rest shift laterally. Again, your uh, Work up, start off with your plain x rays, um, AP and lateral, and uh, the value of a non value of a weight bearing or a standing x ray cannot be overemphasized. You can easily miss subtle injuries if you do not get a weight bearing x ray. Um, there are all these landmarks that we are familiar with. Um, so, the alignment of the first metatarsal and the medial cuneiform lateral border. 
then the alignment of the second metatarsal and the intermediate cuneiform medial border. Then there is the third metatarsal and the lateral cuneiform alignment on oblique views. And similarly for the fourth and the cuboid alignment. Um, now, CT scan plays an important role here um, to get the uh, one to help with your diagnosis, but CT scan, do not forget, it is not a dynamic imaging modality, it is a static imaging modality. So it is an extension of your non-weight bearing X-ray. Sometimes a weight bearing X-ray can give you more information than a CT scan, but a CT scan is invaluable in surgical planning and getting a three-dimensional three -dimensional picture of um, the fractures. MRI has some value. It's not routinely used for uh, Liz Frank injuries. Now look at this. This was a 50-year-old patient. Um, she had a fall and she had a um, midfoot pain, seen in casualty, labeled as a normal X-ray, um, sent to orthopedic fracture clinic. Um, persisting pain after a few days, um, X-ray looks normal. Um, I tried to get a standing X-ray, but she could not stand due to pain. So in such cases, this can be a problem for foot injuries and ankle injuries. They may not be able to get a standing X-ray straight away. There's no harm in waiting for a week. So after a week, um, we got a weight-bearing X-ray, which showed that there is a Liz Frank injury I'm not sure how much you can appreciate from these projections, but uh, the second metatarsal has, um, there is a step at the second metatarsal intermediate cuneiform joint. So there is an opening up. So these opening ups about two to five millimeter, they're diagnostic of a Liz Frank injury. And this patient um, had a fixation. So this is how I'd like to do it. I put a home run screw from the medial cuneiform into the second metatarsal and a dorsal neutralizing plate. Um, MRI scans can be helpful if all the other um, investigations are normal. You can see the um, high signal in the ligament. Um, in very swollen feet, if you cannot um, feel the pulse, it may be useful to get a Doppler ultrasound or use your handheld Doppler. Now, subtle Liz Frank injuries. How do I go about diagnosing them? It, it, is, it is not an easy problem. If there is no obvious fracture, but the per patient has persisting pain, local tenderness, and your history is suggestive, that is, if you have a cl strong clinical suspicion, obviously you do your conventional X-ray first anyway. If your conventional X-ray is abnormal, that is, it shows a Liz Frank fracture, then you need a CT scan to plan surgery. And then you go on to a definitive procedure. So that's all fine. The problem is you have a strong clinical suspicion, but your conventional X-rays are normal. Okay. Then you have to get your weight-bearing X-ray. Weight-bearing X-ray, you, you have to make your team aware, your radiologists aware, or your radiographers aware that weight-bearing X-rays are invaluable for these. So a lot of these patients get repeated X-rays every week. Um, they repeat a non-weight bearing x-rays, they're labeled as normal and the patient is sent home and they keep coming back. So it's so once they can tolerate, the, manage the pain and tolerate a weight bearing x-ray once they're able to stand, preferably a monopedal, that is try and get them to stand on one on the foot, get the weight on that foot and get a weight bearing x-ray. Again, if these are abnormal, um, you do a planning CT and go into a definitive procedure. Now, if your weight-bearing X-ray is normal and you cannot see a fracture, then it could be that is just a ligament injury. Uh, and uh, if the weight-bearing X-ray shows that there is no opening up, that means your lig ligament injury is stable. It may be just a sprain. Um, so you could consider doing an MRI scan, um, but then the question is, if there is no displacement, would you do anything? Maybe not, but at least you can protect it and keep a close eye on them. You can counsel the patient as well. It's important to tell the patient you know, what the problem is rather than, you know, so you, the patient also should have a realistic expectation of what the um, 
long-term prognosis of future potential future problems are. So in, in such situations, it's important to have an honest dialogue with the patient. And uh, it's important not to give them a very rosy picture. Because even after a definite fix, fixation, I'll come to that in a minute, but in the long run, they do not, you know, they do not get, get, get up and running at three months. A lot of them do have persisting pain from six months to a year. So it's important to counsel these patients properly. The first contact itself. Now treatment, if it's just a Liz Frank sprain, or like I said, if this is ligament injury, but there is no opening up, you can treat them non-weight bearing in a cast or a removable boot, give them six weeks to recover and uh, send them to your physiotherapist. Um, if there's a fracture or a dislocation or a fracture dislocation, you have to do a reduction and uh, use whatever metal work to fix it. Now this metal work to fix it has has gone through an evolution from uh, percutaneous K wires to we have come to open locking plate fixation. Um, how do you go about? I've already discussed the positioning and uh, preparation for uh, show part injuries, which applies for least Frank injuries as well. Um, so your, your incisions depend on how many rays you would want to fix it. So you have to go in with a plan after your CT scan. So if you are just fixing the second, just one dorsal incision should be enough. Um, if you are do, doing one and two, you can get away with one incision between the first and second, you, or you can do um, a medial incision and one dorsal incision. So the structures at risk are your dorsal neurovascular bundle, the dorsal spirits and the deep peroneal and the um, superficial peroneal nerve cutaneous branches. Fixation methods, um, like I said, KYs or screws um, have gone out and um, most surgeons prefer plate fixation. Um, even if you use a plate fi fixation, I like to put these home run screws from the medial cuneiform into the um, second uh, metatarsals. These, these are uh, Google image pictures. They are not my pictures. Um, yeah, we will come to... So again, there is a lot in the literature about using these flexible fixation devices. Your tightrope, the tightrope that you use for syndesmosis stabilization in ankle fractures, they can be used for Lisfranc stabilization as well. Um, yeah, I will illustrate what I do with this case. This is a 21 year old um, who fell off a ladder. So it's quite a dramatic picture, isn't it? So the first, um, the first, second, third, fourth, they're all disrupted. All five are disrupted here. So how, how do I go about, obviously these patients are, um, he, he had a provisional reduction and a plaster stabilization in casualty. And uh, then we keep him on the ward, elevate, let the soft tissue settle down before doing an open procedure. And he has a CT scan in the meantime for your surgical planning. Now in theater, positioning has been discussed. I do a stepwise reduction. So try and start from the medial ray, the first TMT joint and work, work my way laterally. So I put provisional fixation, percutaneous wires and check my reduction in both views. So get your first TMT, that is your pillar, that's your base. Get your first TMT lined up and reduced both on AP and lateral views. Put K wires to hold them. Then you do your definitive fixation of your first TMT joint. So here I've used a medial approach um, I've, I've done this just so that I do not have two incisions dorsally close to each other and uh, to avoid a lot of um, dissection through very thin, skin, um, thin soft tissue dorsally, especially I think the skin was quite bruised dorsally. So I went through a medial approach where you have a good uh, soft tissue padding and I stabilized the first TMT with this uh, lapidus plate. It's quite a nice useful plate. So you can easily get two, two in proximally and two distally at least. So once your medial ray is stabilized, then you get ready for your home run screw. So you get 
So I put a AO clamp, your point tube reduction clamp from the medial cuneiform to the second metatarsal. Get it nicely lined up. Check on x-rays that your second TMD, that is your key, your keystone. Make sure your keystone is lined up. Then you can put a guide wire and put in a cannulated screws. You can go from metatarsal to medial cuneiform or medial cuneiform to metatarsal. Just make sure it is uh, lined up and reduced, just like you put in a syndesmotic screw. Then you do a dorsal plate to stabilize that. So here the third was badly disrupted as well. So I've used a sort of H plate or a squarish plate. Um, that's um, I use this striker kit for these. So they've got nice locking plates. They take 3.5 and 3 millimeter locking screws and now locking screws. So I put bigger screws in the tarsal and the smaller screws distally. So you can put non locking screws to get the plate sitting flush on the bone. It's important to get the plate sitting flush on the bone so that they don't poke under the skin and rub in the shoe. And then, then you're done. Lateral, it's very important not to rigidly fix your lateral column. Your lateral column should be flexible. Um, you can get away without fixing the lateral column uh, without any fixation because these are connected by intermetatarsal ligaments. But considering the significant disruption, um, I put in a K-wire, a percutaneous K-wire, which came out after four weeks. So you have a rigid fixation of columns one, two, and three, and a flexible fixation of four and five, or you know, if you're happy, you can leave them. And that is the final picture after I took the K-wire out. Now, high energy, um, list frank injuries, uh, just like show part, you need, see, your initial soft tissue management is important. You do your provisional stabilization and then do a definitive fixation after it stabilizes. Now, prognosis, the single most important factor affecting prognosis is accuracy of reduction. Lining up your first and second TMT joint is key. Um, just like I said earlier, um, you may be able to get the patient walking maybe with or without support at two to three months, but they usually have persisting pain for anything between six year, six months to a year. And it's unusual to have a complete symptom-free early recovery. And most of these patients uh, take about six months to a year to get back to what they were doing before. And uh, sportsmen, athletes, they should be counseled that they could have some restriction. Complications, there could be mechanical complications, collapse of arch. Uh, if there is a collapse of arch, then you should consider giving them functional orthosis initially. And if it comes to that, offer a midfoot fusion. And uh, post-traumatic OA is very common. Um, radiographic OA will be seen, but not all of them have significant functional limitation. Vascular injury is a problem, depending again on the mechanism. Compartment syndrome, obviously an early complication. Um, you should be aware how to manage compartment syndrome on an emergent basis. You have these DOS, two dorsal incision and with or without one medial incision fasciotomy for uh, compartment release in such situations. Again, going back to the discussion on primary fusions, um, primary fusions is technically easier in Lisfranc injuries than Chopart injuries or calcaneal fractures because your anatomy is not so badly disrupted. Uh, but the primary fusion, um, there's a lot of favor for primary fusion for pure ligament injuries. So this is a classic paper by Lee and Coetzee. They actually report better results with fusion if it is a ligamentous list frank. And again, they've seen less reoperation. There's, there's this paper, they, they've reported less reoperation in primary fusion. And uh, they did not have any metal removal um, and no deformities. Now, do you have to remove the metal? Um, the practice is uh, variable. Um, I have not, I do not routinely remove metal. I have had to take out um, metal only once or twice because the plates, so I think one of the screws backed out and it was rubbing against the skin. But otherwise, um, I do not routinely take metal work out. And there is no evidence to that, you know, there is a requirement for, there is no evidence and there is no consensus either way. Um, 
Yeah. Now, that's about closed list flank injuries. Now, coming to open, um, open midfoot injuries, crush injuries. Uh, they are they are very complex foot injuries. Okay. So mechanisms could be any of the ones that we described above. Um, but um, and there are so many classifications and gradings described. This Schoen grading goes for any open fracture with soft tissue injury, grades zero to three. And uh, this ZWIP, they've, they've designed a scoring system to, for complex foot and ankle injuries. So distal tibia fibula, like your pylons, they score one, talus score two, calcaneum three, show part injuries four, and list frying injuries five. So if this zip score plus the Schoen score is more than five, then you have a very complex injury with poor outcome. Now, early management, um, so most of this would be high energy trauma. So your management would, would follow the ATLS principles. Then you assess your circulation and neurology, and then you get your imaging, x-rays, and uh, most of these patients would need a CT scan, I presume. Then you do not go in for definitive fixation. Um, we do our damage control orthopedics. Um, so after your assessment, um, you reduce any dislocations and stabilize them. Uh, most of these would need an external fixator. So have your um, external fixator kit handy. Now, soft tissue management and infection prevention is another <clears throat> big um, issue with these. Um, so if you have bone extrusion or a significant um, uh, bone loss, then you may end up with uh, having to manage dead space. Um, so there are several components to managing this. One, you have to do your initial wound care. Then you have to appropriate antibiotic therapy and the patient may need multiple visits to theater for wound debridement and um, uh, soft tissue defect management. So you can use um, local antibiotic carriers or bone cement with impregnated local antibiotics uh, to manage these. And you may need the plastic surgeon on your team to come and help you later with flap cover or skin graft. Um, we've already talked about fasciotomy for compartment syndrome. Now, um, a timeline of management for this is very important. So we have to know what we should be doing within hours, what we should be doing within days. And there are some parts of the management that can possibly wait a week or two. So within hours, so you have to manage ischemia and necrosis within hours. So what are the components of that? One is identifying and, and managing compartment syndrome. That has to be done within hours, imminently. The day of presentation, you should not let the sun set on in a compartment syndrome. Other problem is skin compromise or skin threat from a tenting displaced fracture or from a dislocation. So if there's a significant telonavicular dislocation, for example, um, so that can lead to um, skin tending and skin necrosis um, if left. So these have to be managed in an emergent fashion within hours. Second thing is um, management for the first few days is aimed at preventing infection. So you, if there is an open wound, you may have to take the patient to theater one or more times, wash it out, debride, local antibiotic, systemic antibiotic, and stabilization. So this whole package of care we should be done within the first few days to prevent infection, both early infection and long-term infection. Then in some really bad cases, you may have to make a call whether you need to do an early amputation or whether you can proceed with the limb salvage modalities of treatment. Next comes your definitive management, which obviously um, can wait a week or two. Um, your um, navicular plating or cuboid plating, bridge plating, these can wait up to two weeks. Your list frank stabilized I've done, done list frank stabilization in the third week because you had to wait for the soft tissue to settle. Uh, during that time, 
the fruit will be stabilized in an external fixator or percutaneous pins and plaster. And your definitive fixation can uh, wait till the, the soft tissue is ready for that. So that is something for the first two or three weeks. Now we talked about making a decision regarding limb salvage and amput early amputation. So what are the absolute indications for amputation? One is severe polytrauma, um, uncontrolled bleeding. If there is a large vessel injury around the angle of foot that is leading to uncontrolled bleeding, you may have to consider doing that. One, then second is lack of resources, which fortunately most of us don't have to face, uh, but in a war setting or in a war scenario, this is something they used to do. Uh, then if the patient has come in with a near total amputation already with a small skin and soft tissue bridge, then you may have to do an early amputation. There are some relative indications where you have to think about an amputation and seriously discuss the discuss amputation with um, the patient and get advice of colleagues is there's a complete tibial nerve transection. So if there's a complete tibial nerve transection, there is anesthetics, the soul, whole of soul is, is um, anesthetic. The patient will not have any um, feeling there. So in terms of locomotion, in terms of proprioception, it may be a useless foot. So that's why in such a situation, a nerve injury is worse than a vascular injury because a vascular injury can be repaired, but this complete tibial nerve transaction may give the patient a useless foot. Another is a non-reconstructable vascular injury. If there is a length loss, it cannot be repaired and uh, you cannot use a bypass in the foot, obviously. So a non-reconstructable vascular injury is another relative indication. Then loss of talus, Talus is a keystone of the foot, so that is a problem. If there is significant loss of soft tissue in the sole, and if there is significant crushing of the forefoot, then you may have to consider doing a midfoot amputation. Right, so that sort of, um, I've tried to um, sum up the management of um, complex midfoot injuries and uh, open injuries. Um, these are not easy. Fortunately, these are not very common. Um, practice is different in, in different parts of the world. Um, most big institutions are going towards specialized trauma management. That is, you have an upper limb surgeon managing complex upper limb trauma. You have a foot and ankle surgeon managing complex foot and ankle trauma. Obviously, with these, the results are better because these are not common injuries. So if one or two specialized people manage these, obviously they get, you know, they get the numbers, they get the skills and they get better results. And in some of these, you need a, a team to, you know, you may need a vascular surgeon on board. You may need a plastic surgeon on board. You need the physios on board. You need an orthotist on board. So it's important to manage, approach this as a team as well. Anyway, hopefully I've given you some idea, a brief overview of this. This, uh, this is the Lincolnshire Wolds. It's a beautiful valley in uh, rural England in the Northeast. Uh, in summer, it's, uh, you know, um, it's, it's, it's pretty, very beautiful in summer, pretty bleak in winter though. It, all these leaves fall and you know, it's not much fun in the winter at this time of the year. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Nigel. Fantastic lecture. You've gone so much into depth about list rank and show part. There's hardly any room for any questions. Thank you. But just uh, just before we wind up, I'll, I'll just want to know a couple of things. Sure, sure. Your opinion on, what is your take on weight-bearing CT scan? Now, there's a lot of talk on WBCT. There's a whole study group that is evolving on WBCT. So you, we talked about weight-bearing radiographs. And even there are surgeons who look at, especially the radiologists who look for Weight-bearing MRI scans. Yeah. So weight-bearing CT scan is the in thing in the last two or three years, um, especially in foot and angle field. So um, it hasn't caught on in a great deal in England. So there is a group in France that is pioneering this. If you go on you know, professional networking sites and search for François Lins, L-I-N-T-S, he's written up a lot on weight-bearing CT scans. So um, I went to a meeting last year and where he was talking about weight-bearing CT scans. A lot of it, I mean, um, 
it's it 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 is um hasn't caught on to the, the trauma centers but he is doing some um, some elective work with uh, you know planned work reconstructing uh, foot deformities reconstructing flat foot cave of errors feet um just uh, because weight bearing ct would give them a dynamic picture of uh, if what's involved i would say it's still in its early stages we haven't reached a stage where we can use it for trauma management because there's a cost issue there's an access issue uh but maybe 5 years down the line you know we may be uh, talking differently about it but it is definitely catching on in the continent and uh, you know there is literature coming out on that i haven't come across any publication where they use it in a trauma setting because this is only in a very highly specialized units that do a lot of research um wow. so it is um not easy in an acute setting if i put it that way but maybe still, like i said 5 years down the line it could be different still in its infancy yes still in its infancy absolutely okay thank you for that uh the other question is uh, how do you treat a purely ligamentous lis frank do you choose internal fixation or do you think an arthrodesis yeah is superior Dif- difficulty is the answer <laughs> but um uh, pure ligamentous lis frank once if you diagnosed instability you have to operate okay so i think there were one case there's one one of my patient that i showed an x ray on there was no fracture but on weight bearing the first intermetatarsal space was opening up so if you talk about if you think of the what can happen to the ligament if the ligament is sprained but is still continuous the the in the first and second team that team that space will not open up if that space is less than 2 mm if there is no gap so uh, then you can keep them non weight bearing treat them in a plaster or a boot so give give them a plaster for the first two weeks then a boot and let them start slowly start weight bearing if there is no displacement if there if if it hasn't opened up if if it has opened up if it is more than 2 mm gap then that means that ligament is torn it's not just a sprain so the ligament is torn then you have to reduce it and fix it so the case that i showed you i reduced it and put a home run screw cuneiform to metatarsal and stabilize with the dorsal plate um surgeons do advise primary fusion in these uh that patient that i did she was uh, you know she had pain for about 6 months and it took a while to settle if you look at it you know it's not a there's no fracture dislocation there just that ligament sprain she took she took more than 6 months to get over the pain so it's not easy that's why in that uh, chris cotsi's paper they advise fusion i haven't tried primary fusion for any of my patients i've done fusion only for one patient that came to me very late after 4 weeks otherwise the ones that i get within 2 weeks i have not done a primary fusion personally but there are surgeons who do i advocate that so the answer to your question is if there is displacement fix it if there is no display, if there is no displacement then how do you diagnose it only on an M- on an mri scan will show you isn't it so if there is no displacement then what are you reducing you can just treat them in a plaster and keep them non weight bearing for 4 to 6 weeks and do you think there's a role for those beaming screws that we use for charcoal do you think we can put that and get a fusion for those ligamentous lis fracks you the beaming I mean, screws extrapolating the knowledge from charcoal oh that's a bit harsh man <laughs> because <laughs> they are really huge screws uh no not for these no okay and uh, again the other question is regarding the tight rope okay there's a lot of hype for using the tight rope do you think there's enough evidence to say that a tight rope because it's still a flexible fixation isn't it yeah there is evidence to use tight rope in syndesmosis uh, angle syndesmosis but um not enough for lis frank uh, injuries I and mean, there are one or two that i have come across they report good results um but um personally i mean that can be used only for isolated ligament injuries mind you so how many isolated ligament injuries would you get lot of them are fracture dislocations okay so that means the flexible fixation is out if it's a fracture dislocation so tight rope um in my books can be used only for pure ligamentous and the the evidence is minimal low low quality evidence right low quality. 
We do not have level one data to say that. Not even data to say that. Any such. But for the syndesmos is definitely flexible fusion. Flexible syndesmos stabilization is you know. There is no question about that. Because the biomechanics is different, right? In the ankle as well as in the uh, list frank down. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Nigel. I think that's all the questions that we have. There are a lot of people who are watching this lecture online. I could just see that this is really engaged with the audience. Thank you so much for joining in. And we really look forward for another lecture from your side later on. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And enjoy the rest of your weekend. Stay safe. Yeah, bye-bye.